You gotta take care of our immortal souls. You know you can't read. It's the Bible, you get credit for trying. Hereditary sphericitosis belongs to hemolytic anemias. This disorder is inherited by autosomal dominant pattern, and the major feature of this disease is defect in proteins that interact with red blood cell membrane skeleton and plasma membrane. It can be defect in encrine, ben 3 protein, protein 4.2 spectrin. This results in formation of a small round red blood cells with no central paler and with decreased surface area. Such cells we call spherocytes. With decrease in surface area of red blood cells, the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration increase, which is an important diagnostic feature of hereditary spherocytosis. The problem with spherocytes is that such cells have decreased flexibility. So, when red blood cells pass through the spleen, spherocytes can get stuck in the splenic capillaries and this will force splenic macrophages to remove them from the circulation. A truly discomforting notion, love. And bad. Bad for every mother's son what calls himself pirate. So, when red blood cells pass through the spleen, spherocytes can get stuck in the splenic capillaries, and this will force splenic macrophages to remove them from the circulation. So, what do we mean by membrane skeleton? I know what you think. It's probably some Batman shit. But no, it's just red blood cell. Red blood cells have plasma membrane, and also red blood cells have cytoskeleton, which is composed of a specific proteins, as ancrine, ben 3 protein, protein 4.2, and spectrin. The cytoskeleton determines the biconcave shape and flexibility of red blood cells. Also, red blood cells with biconcave shape have central paler, and they have a normal surface area that determines mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. In addition to this, cytoskeleton provides osmotic resistance to red blood cells. But in hereditary spherocytosis, autosomal dominant mutation occurs, which disrupts the production of cytoskeleton proteins. So, how spherocytes are formed? Let's discuss this step by step. So, let's suppose that in this region we cannot produce cytoskeleton proteins. Without cytoskeleton proteins, we cannot maintain the normal shape of the plasma membrane. And without cytoskeleton support, plasma membrane basically bumps out. In this region the same story. Without supporting proteins, plasma membrane will also bump out. In the central region, the same principle. Without cytoskeleton support, plasma membrane bumps out. So, as a result, instead of biconcave shape, red blood cells will have spherical shape, and such round red blood cells we call spherocytes. Gentlemen. So, the major problem in hereditary spherocytosis is disruption of red blood cell cytoskeleton. First of all, this will affect the shape of red blood cells. They become round, and such round red blood cells we call spherocytes. And the problem is that red blood cells that have round shape are less flexible. Also, they will lose central paler, and with round shape, their surface area will decrease. As a result, this will cause increase in mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. The second feature is that with disruption of red blood cell cytoskeleton, the osmotic resistance of red blood cells decrease, and this will cause increase in osmotic fragility that we can determine by a specific test. So, due to the mutation, bone marrow begin to produce red blood cells that have round shape, and we call them spherocytes. As any red blood cells, spherocytes inside them have lactate dehydrogenase enzyme and hemoglobin. Once spherocytes are produced, they enter into the bloodstream and they circulate in the blood freely until they reach spleen. The problem with spleen is that splenic capillaries are very narrow blood vessels, 
and to pass through them, red blood cells should be flexible. But spherocytes have round shape, which makes them less flexible. And because spherocytes are more rigid cells, they have difficulty navigating through these narrow passages. So when spherocytes pass through the spleen, their decreased flexibility and round shape make them prone to getting trapped in the splenic capillaries. Once they stuck in the capillaries, they become an easy target for splenic macrophages. The destruction of red blood cells by splenic macrophages we call extravascular hemolysis. And with time, extremely active extravascular hemolysis will cause splenomegaly. With destruction of red blood cells, the substances that were contained inside the red blood cells will enter into the blood. It's like dehydrogenase and hemoglobin. Destruction of red blood cells cause decrease in red blood cell count and decrease in hemoglobin, and decrease in hemoglobin level we call anemia. In response to red blood cells destruction, bone marrow activates erythropoiesis in order to compensate red blood cells destruction by increasing red blood cells production. This will cause increase in red blood cells precursors, and such red blood cells precursors we call reticulocytes. To produce cells, we need DNA, and to produce DNA, we require a lot of folic acid. So overactive erythropoiesis, with time, will cause depletion of folic acid. So with time, folate deficiency will develop. We have to know that some infections can inhibit erythropoiesis. The most common infection is parvovirus B19. And sudden decrease in red blood cells production combined with increased rate of red blood cells destruction, can cause aplastic crisis. Basically, aplastic crisis is the state when the quantity of red blood cells in the blood suddenly decreases. No! No good! No! So, in predisposed patients, as for example, patients with thalassemia or hereditary spherocytosis, parvovirus infection can create a huge problem. There'll be no living with her after this. With red blood cells destruction, lactate dehydrogenase enters into the blood. So with hemolysis, the concentration of LDH in the blood will increase. And elevation of LDH is a well-known marker of hemolysis. In addition to this, with destruction of red blood cells, free hemoglobin enters into the blood. And free hemoglobin has several pathways. Recall that free hemoglobin undergo degradation to protoporphyrin and after to bilirubin. And increase in bilirubin concentration in the blood can cause jaundice and also it greatly increases the risk of bilirubin gas transformation. We have to know that free hemoglobin is extremely dangerous molecule due to the one simple reason. Free hemoglobin has iron and iron by Fenton reaction can cause severe oxidative injury. So to prevent this, we have to neutralize free hemoglobin. And in the blood we have a specific molecule for this. It's haptoglobin. Haptoglobin binds to hemoglobin and in this form they circulate through the bloodstream until they will income into the spleen. In the spleen, splenic macrophages will phagocyte and destroy this complex. So by this, we can prevent oxidative injury by free iron in the blood. This is either madness or brilliance. It's remarkable how often those two traits coincide. And because for elimination of one hemoglobin molecule, we use one haptoglobin molecule. With release of free hemoglobin due to the hemolysis, the amount of haptoglobin molecules will decrease. And decrease in haptoglobin level is a well-known marker of hemolytic anemia. I know that. 
As additional diagnostic features, we should mention increase in mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration and increased osmotic fragility. So let's explain all these diagnostic features based on some real-life cases. Here we can see complete blood count and antiglobulin test in patients with hereditary spherocytosis. As we see, there are no autoantibodies against red blood cells, so Coombs test is negative. Basically, it tells us that there is no autoimmune aggression against red blood cells. Do you notice anything? Rather, do you notice something that is not there to be noted? Hemoglobin is 94, which we classify as moderate anemia. And in this case, we see a huge percentage of reticulocytes, which tell us about extremely active erythropoiesis. And from the presence of such massive amount of spherocytes, we know that bone marrow tries to produce more red blood cells in response to excessive red blood cells destruction. Also, bilirubin level is significantly elevated, and we know that it's due to the excessive release of free hemoglobin molecules due to the extravascular hemolysis. So, the most important clinical features of hereditary spherocytosis is splenomegaly, pigmented Galston's formation, and high risk of a plastic crisis with parvovirus B19 infection. So, how we can verify diagnosis? First of all, it's EMA binding test. Here we can see red blood cells from healthy patient and from a patient with hereditary spherocytosis. And here we can see graph. Black is healthy, red is not. What is the logic here? To differentiate healthy from pathological cells, we add to red blood cells EMA, which is basically a dye. But it's not a simple dye. EMA binds specifically to cytoskeleton proteins, as Ben3 protein. And once EMA binds to red blood cells, we can determine this by fluorescence which is basically a light radiating from red blood cells. The problem is that in hereditary spherocytosis, cytoskeleton proteins are defective, which means that EMA cannot bind to them. And with decrease in binding of dye to cytoskeleton proteins, obviously fluorescence becomes less prominent. And we can determine this by flow cytometry. As we see in this case, mean fluorescence intensity in patients with hereditary spherocytosis was significantly below normal. This is either madness or brilliance. It's remarkable how often those two traits coincide. The second test, called osmotic fragility test. So, this zebra line is how it should be in normal state. And the red line is for patients with hereditary spherocytosis. The distance between blue and zebra line is normal reference range. Numbers below stand for concentration of sodium chloride solution. And sodium chloride concentration here goes from 1% to 0%. 0% is basically water, and 0.9% is the physiologic concentration of sodium chloride in our blood. And vertical numbers tell us about the percentage of destroyed red blood cells. Basically, the less concentrated is the solution, the more rapidly water will go inside the red blood cells, and thereby the more rapidly red blood cells will be osmotically compromised, and this water inside them will eventually cause their rupture. Thank you, Jack. So, as we can see, before incubation, to destroy 60% of normal red blood cells, we require 0.4% solution of sodium chloride. But to destroy 60% of spherocytes, we require just 0.5% solution. Why? Because defect in cytoskeleton makes spherocytes extremely fragile cells. And such defective cytoskeleton cannot hold this rapid income of water inside the red blood cells. So because the same percentage of spherocytes get destroyed in more concentrated solution, or we can call this more physiological solution because it's closer to 0.9, 
we call spherocytes osmotically fragile cells. After incubation, the same principle. There are normal cells and there are spherocytes. As we see, 40% of normal cells are destroyed in 0.4 solution, but 40% of spherocytes are destroyed even in 0.55 solution. Exactly this feature we call increase in osmotic fragility. The treatment is simple. It's splenectomy. I like it. Simple, easy to remember. The reason is that we cannot correct the mutation that cause formation of spherocytes, but we can eliminate the site of spherocytes destruction. So splenectomy will prolong their life in the bloodstream. And also, we give to a patient folic acid, simply because usually they have folate deficiency due to the overactive erythropoiesis. Go home.